Good morning. After the excellent lecture of Dr. Amonjas about the nasal anatomy, the following presentation talks about the anatomy of the cellar and paracellar region, uh, and we're going to do an intracranial endonasal correlation. With the introduction of the endoscope, the anatomy of the skull base has been divided into several anatomical departments. Nowadays, we are attending to different conferences of endoscopic endonasal anatomy, microscopic endonasal anatomy, microscopic intracranial anatomy. And my question is, do you think there are different anatomies? My answer is no. It's all the same anatomy, but from different points of view or instruments used. The objective of this session is to solve the cellar and paracellar anatomy from two different points of view, the intracranial view and the endonasal view. For that, we use a catabetic head injected with latex and preserved in formalin. We perform a coronal cut at the level of the posterior ethmoid, cribriform plate, and maxillary sinus in order to progress our dissection through the cellar and paracellar region, keeping in mind the two points of view, the intracranial and the endonasal. The use of an endoscope is not necessary to perform this dissection, so you can do this dissection in your own lab without an HD endoscope. We have dissected all the nasal and paranasal structures that you can identify here, already explained by Dr. Amonjas, to reach this view of the anterior wall of the sphenoid sinus. Before continuing with the dissection, we should talk about the sphenoid bone and its parts. As you know, the esphenoid bone is the cornerstone of the skull base around which are articulated the frontal bone anteriorly, the temporal bones laterally, the occipital bone posteriorly, forming together the entire skull base around it. We are going to use this classical anterior view of the sphenoid bone to explain it. In the center, we have the body. Projected superiorly and laterally, we have the lesser wings, laterally with the greater wings of the esphenoid, and inferiorly, we have both pterygoid processes. You can also see here in the pterygoid processes this base of both pterygoids where we can check two holes, two foramina. This is the foramen rotundum and this is the median canal. The esphenoid body has a crest on its anterior wall, which articulates with the bomber, as you can see here. This crest is used as the midline reference during the transesphenoidal approaches. Sometimes we have not a navigator, just an X-ray lateral, and so we know here the midline, the crest of the esphenoid is always the midline. It's very important. This. Let's go back to our dissection on the most anterior part of the body we find the sphenoid crest, as we have just said, on the sphenoidal rostrum, and both the sphenoidal ostia at its side. In this view, we can also see two structures located anteriorly and laterally, both orbits, anteriorly and superiorly, and both maxillary sinus. In the right side, we have removed the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus in order to expose the components of the pterygopalatine fossa. Talking about the ostium sphenoidal, we can use uh, a useful anatomical reference to find it, the superior turbinate tail. Once the anterior sphenoid sinus has been drilled, we find its pneumatized interior. This procedure is called a sphenoidotomy, and during a surgery, we must perform it as wide as possible in order to recognize the reference inside the sphenoid sinus. Although we talk always about minimal invasive surgeries, in our opinion, a wider sphenoidotomy makes the surgery safer. The sphenoid septation can be unique, or many can be centered, or located towards the carotid. In an article of Dr. Fernandez Miranda and collaborators of the, from the University of Pittsburgh, up to 90% of the specimens had at least one septum towards the carotid as you can check here in these uh, pictures of this paper. 
The sinus can be more or less pneumatized in the coronal or sagittal plane. In the sagittal plane, we can classify this pneumatization into the cellar type. If it exposes the entire cellar floor, it's around 70-75%. The pre-cellar type, if it exposes just the anterior part of the cellar, it's around 20 or 25%. And the conchal one, if the sinus is not pneumatized, it meaning less than 3%. That situation makes the, the endonasal surgery harder. The coronal plane pneumatization is well described in this article of Professor Rotten and collaborators, published about three, four years ago, and considers if the pneumatization goes towards the lesser winds, the greater winds, or the pterygoids. Based on this article, we have different types. The body type, if it does not expand. Here you can see the lesser wind type. Here, the greater wind type, the pterygoid type, and the mixed type, it's because it's a mix of the greater wind and pterygoid wind. As you can check in these pictures, we are always using this anatomical line as a reference. This is the line between the median nerve, located medially and inferiorly, and this is the foramen rotundum, located superiorly and laterally. Once a wide sphenoidotomy is performed, the objective is to recognize the intrasphenoidal surgery, intrasphenoidal anatomy, sorry. Therefore, we'll start drilling the intrasphenoidal septa. In this particular specimen, there is a huge midline septum located, located in the centrum of the cellar. If we advance with the, with the drilling, we can see that there is another small septum located horizontally and towards the paraclival carotid. Once all of the septa have been drilled, we can recognize their insertion pathways, as you can see here. If the sphenoid is well pneumatized, like in, in this case, the anatomical landmarks are going to be easily recognizable. So, a question. Can anyone tell me what structure is this? In the center of the sphenoid sinus, you see? Cellar floor, okay. And what structures? Which structures are these located laterally and superiorly? Both optic nerves, okay? And the most important thing, you need to know it, which structures are these? Carotid arteries with its paracellar segment and paraclival segment. Okay, I will be very proud of myself if after my lecture, these structures are, are, these references are clear. And, okay, more a specific and endoscopic reference are these. These are called the lateral optic carotid crests, lateral OCR, and these are located laterally to the junction of the optic nerve with the paraclinoid carotid. In this case, it's well pneumatized. Another landmark, is the medial optic carotid recess, and in its case, is located medial to the junction of the optic nerve and the paraclinoid carotid. In some cases, like this, it's almost impossible to differentiate anatomy until all the septa have been drilled. Here we have an example of a patient with a complex pattern of septation. It's a 30 years uh, male with a cushing disease caused by a microadenoma. And okay, first of all, I want to mark the importance of having a CT scan, as Dr. Nieto said uh, this morning, before the surgery. Uh, we usually ask a CT angio in order to see better several aspects important. The septation, as you can see here, in this patient was really complex, not just a, a middle, middle, midline uh, septation, horizontal, vertical, 
Okay. The pneumatization, in this case, we have uh, uh, which kind of, uh, of uh, pneumatization in the sagittal plane is this? Stellar, okay. And which kind of pneumatization we have in the coronal plane here? Okay, we have doubts, but probably it's just a leisure wind type. And I don't know, I'm not sure if it's uh, something, some, some lateral pneumatization. Anyway, and with the contrast, we check the shape and variance of the carotid arteries. It's very important because you can check that the tumor is not an aneurysm. Now a video, T take, all, take off your glasses for a while for the video. Here, although the sphenotomy is not complete yet, we can identify some structures, the optic nerve, optic carotids, cellar, cellar floor. Now we are widening the sphenoidotomy. Here, drilling all this complex pattern of septation. We are trying to expose all the reference, removing some pieces of mucosa. Now, when the cellar and paracellar floor is drilled, we can check the anatomy with a navigator device, but you must trust on your own knowledge of the anatomy because the navigator devices are accurate devices but have errors. Here, the cellar in the centrum, carotids, laterally, optic nerves, superiorly and laterally. This seems to be a simple maneuver, but if we have not cleared the center of our exposure, it may be a disaster. Imagine if it's not uh, the cellar floor, it's a uh, carotid. Now again, the glazes. Getting back to our dissection, we see the sphenoid sinus without its septa and with a wider sphenoidotomy. Removing the bone and the dura from the cellar and paracellar floor, we can identify better the pituitary gland in the center, both paracellar segments of the carotid artery, the optic nerves, laterally and superiorly, here the tuberculum cell region, and here you can see in blue the intercavernous sinus, which are connecting both cavernous sinus. And the clival rests below. If you are not used with this endonasal anatomy, in order to recognize better the structures of the cellular region, we need to correlate this view with the intracranial view. Before making any correlation with intracranial anatomy, we need to review the superior, uh, the superior classical view of the sphenoid bone. So we must recognize the planum sphenoidale, where, where both lesser wings bone together. These are both lesser wings, and this is the planum sphenoidale. The posterior, the posterior limit of the planum sphenoidale is the um, uh, sphenoid uh, jugum. Okay. Next, the anterior clinoid processes projected posteriorly from both lesser wings. Here, the tuberculum cella. Here, the chiasmatic sulcus. I always say that the chiasmatic sulcus is like the chiasmas mirror. The cellar floor. The dorsum cellar posteriorly with both posterior processes. And laterally, both carotid sulcus. And more laterally, some important holes for aminus, for amin rotundum, for amin ovale, and for amin spinosum. A more detailed view of the anterior clinoid process, the sphenoid jugum. The anterior clinoid process and the sphenoid jugum are connected with the roof by the roof of the optic canal. 
it's this. Okay. Here you can see the chiasmatic sulcus and inferior and posterior. And now another relief here, another structure, the tuberculum cellae, that is connected laterally with the anterior clinoid process by a bony column called the optic strut. Now, the optic strut. In this oblique view, we can identify this bony column that goes from the clinoid process to the tuberculum cellae laterally, and it's called, again, the optic strut. And from the endonasal point of view, extends to the lateral optic carotid process. We are going to repeat these landmarks. It might be also the, the reason of a TCF leak after a clinoidectomy if the sphenoid sinus is well nematized. We have to understand the connection between the clinoid process and the endonasal cavity through this bony channel, this bony, this bony column. Sorry. Remember that complex vascular and nervous structures go through the sphenoid bone the pituitary gland and its stalk, both carotid arteries through the cavernous sinus. Let's get back to our dissection. To prepare the intracranial correlation, we have removed the anterior half of the right hemisphere, leaving just nervous and vascular structures, as you can see here. In this superior oblique view of the cellar region, we can see the relationship between the ner optic nerve entering the optic canal and the paraclinoid segment of the carotid, as well as the relationship of the A1 segment of the ACA and the superior aspect of the chiasma. Does anyone see something strange in this picture? An ACOM analyst or neuro neuroradiologist is very Now we have performed an anterior clinoidectomy, so we ask the paraclinoid segment of the carotid between both dural rings, proximal and distal dural ring. And a bony column located anterior to this segment that corresponds to the optic strut, again. Then we have dissected the right cavernous sinus to have a better understanding of the intracranial anatomy. And now let's start the correlation. Helping us with this uh, metallic tool, uh, we are going to project the endonasal anatomy towards the intracranial, the intracranial part. Let's start with the middle optic erotic recess. In the endonasal approach, it's located medial to the junction of the paraclinoid carotid and the optic nerve. Here you can see both visions, intracranial and the endonasal. Here we have preserved the planum sphenoidale to have both visions and how the tool is projecting towards a place located medial to the junction of the optic nerve and the paraclinoid carotid. This landmark is called the keyhole of the endonasal approach because of the good control of these extractors we have from the nasal uh, point of view, the optic nerve, the carotid, the paraclinoid carotid, and all the supracellular structures. Now let's project now, uh, our tool towards the tuberculum cella region. Now it's located in the midline between both optic, medial optic carotid dresses here. Again, the, the double vision in the nasal and intracranial. You can see how projects the tool. And finally, the intracranial classical view, even a surgical view of the tip of the tool pointing the anterior aspect of the chiasma. This is the reason uh, uh, we call the, the um, chiasmatic sulcus or the tuberculum cellae the chiasmus mirror because it's located just anterior to the anterior aspect of the chiasma. Here you can see 
the, the field you can uh, see from the endonasal view of a transtuberculin approach of the pituitary stalk, the superior hypophyseal arteries, the anterior aspect of the chiasma. Now we are going to point again the lateral optic carotid recess. We have new, we have known this uh, structure from the intracranial part and now from the endonasal. So uh, we, I always imagine this landmark as a triangle with its uh, limits are superiorly the optic nerve, medially the paraclinoid carotid, and laterally the superior orbital fissure. Always the triangle. Now, again, the double vision. Check how the tool is now projected lateral to the carotid and lateral to the optic nerve. And now the intracranial view. Here you can check how the, the tool is located in the optic strut. We have performed the clinoidectomy, but after the clinoidectomy, the only uh, osseous relationship with the sphenoid bone of the clinoid process is this structure, is the optic strut. This is an oblique view of the right lateral sphenoid wall. Here in the center, you have the cellar with the pituitary gland, the clival recess, the right paraclival and paracellar carotids. Okay, this is the right, uh, right uh, lateral uh, wall of the of the sphenoid bone with the cavernous cavernous sinus open and dissected. And here the pointer is now between these nerves. These nerves are joined together and are the sixth nerve and V1 nerve here in the superior orbital fissure are close together, okay? And in the inferior aspect, inferior and lateral aspect, we have this nerve coming from the Meckels, from the Macassarian ganglion to the foramen rotundum in the pterygopalatine fossa. This is V2, okay? So we are between V1 and V2. The intracranial correlation, okay? It's what we want to imagine. V1, V2 is the anterior medial triangle of the cavernous sinus. Again, same vision, uh, clival recess, paraclival carotid, and now the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus. And now we point inferior and lateral to this V2 nerve. And believe me, su anterior and superior to the V3 branch. Believe me, it's V2 and V3. This is the anterior lateral triangle of the cavernous sinus. Now, same view, we are pointing medial to the V2 branch of the Gasserian ganglion and lateral to the paraclival carotid. Which space will be this? Here is not the answer. Why? Because we are looking for the Meckel's cave. And the Meckel's cave, we are not able to see the Meckel's cave from an intracranial view until we do this. Okay, it's just an anatomical exposition for sure. Uh, we cut the trigeminal trunk and uh, reflect anteriorly. And you can check here, uh, okay, it's, uh, I love this picture because you can check here a lot of uh, anatomical hidden part, uh, hidden regions, for example, the, the, the Meckel's cave, for sure, um, the trajectory of the cyst nerve passing through the Dorello's canal. This is the Dorello's canal, located below the, petro the petrosphenoidal ligament. Here you can see also the lacerum segment of the carotid artery, as you know, it's the point where the petrosal segment of the carotid curves and becomes the intracavernous sinus carotid. Okay, and you can also see this ligament is ro uh, roofing the, the lacerum, uh, uh, lacerum foramen and it's called the petrolingual ligament. 
we have removed the planum and the uh, cribriform plate on the right side, and we have connected both, both compartments, the intracranial one and, and the intranasal. Note the, this, this view is uh, good for review all the segments of the carotid artery with uh, an endoscopic nomenclature, okay? Paraclival segment, paracellar segment, paraclinoid segment, close to the ophthalmic one, okay? And posterior communicating is hidden in from this view up to, to the bifurcation there. We can also, with this uh, connected view of both spaces, we can also appreciate the anterior posterior pathway of the optic tract from the orbit passing through the chiasma up to the lateral congeniculate ganglion. In a more advanced step of the dissection, uh, we have exposed the retroclival region between both carotids, as you can see here. This region is the prepontine cistern, and here we can identify the basilar artery with the ICA branch uh, related with this nerve exiting from the pontomedullaris sulcus. Which nerve is this? Six, six nerve. The six nerve is, this is the cisternal trajectory. It's going, uh, it's going towards the Dorelos canal. Okay, we cannot see from this vision because it's lateral to the paraclival carotid and continues inside the cavernous sinus. Now, a picture of a pituitary gland vascularization with the superior hypophyseal artery and the inferior hypophyseal artery, both direct branches of the carotid artery. Here, we can see an inferior hypophyseal artery Okay, if, if in surgery we want to reach this retrocellular region uh, in a patient with a healthy pituitary gland, we uh, have to transpose the, the pituitary gland, sectioning one of these branches, and then pushing laterally the pituitary gland. In our anatomical dissection, we have removed the pituitary gland to, to reach the retrocellular region, here, the interpeduncular system, the top of the basilar trunk. Here, again, we can identify from anterior to posterior the, optica, the anterior aspect of the uh, optic chiasma, the pituitary stalk, behind it, the floor of the third ventricle, and behind both mammillary bodies. Here, also, both P1 segments of the posterior cerebral arteries. Here also uh, the PCOM artery coming from the P1 to the carotid artery. And here below both superior cerebral arteries, okay? With the third nerve coming between, exiting between both, both one, both. We can also see the, the anterior projection of the pituitary of the PCOM artery from P1 up to the internal carotid. And between P1 and superior cellular artery, we can see the exit of the third nerve. Here, an example, uh, take off the glazes for a while. Here, an example of a pituitary macroadenoma causing uh, acromegaly with a supercellular extension up to the, to the floor of the third, uh, through the third ventricle. As a functioning adenoma, so an acromegaly, uh, the complete removal in this, uh, for this tumor was mandatory. Here you can see now the, the cellar component of the tumor has been removed. And here we are trying to dissect the supracellar aspect of the tumor from the arachnoid. Here you can see the diaphragm widened by the tumor, and we are working above this diaphragm. So we are going to even open the arachnoid. And trying to remove the supracellular part, we can identify some important landmarks. 
the optic chiasma and the floor of the third ventricle with a 45 degrees optic. Okay. And in this case, the uh, patient, uh, okay, the acromegaly, uh, we, we, we acute uh, an acromegaly remission and a complete removal of the, of the tumor. Here, another case, this is an adenoid cyst, uh, just a fenestration, an, an endonasal fenestration. And, okay, the, the aim of this video is uh, showing you the supracellular anatomy from the endonasal point of view. It's a 45 uh, optic, optic, uh, optic uh, use, and here you can see all uh, the walls of the, of the arachnoid cyst. Okay? Here, the ACOM artery, here, behind the arachnoid walls, chiasmatic chiasma and optic nerves, here the first cranial nerve, and rectus gyrus. All the entire previous dissection could be performed with uh, the endoscope. In surgery, we cannot conceive the endonasal approaches without the endoscope. The light and the amplitude of vision are the main advantages of the endoscopy. The difference between the endoscope and the microscope can be explained with this example. If we try to see what is beyond this wall, looking, around, looking through the window, with the help of a camera or a telescope, we can get closer thanks to the zoom. But if the window is narrow, we will never get a wider visual field. It's a similar situation that we find with the microscope through the nose. But if we can get a camera beyond that narrow window, we get the maximal visual feel of the landscape, just as we got in the asphenoid sinus with the endoscope. All the more endoscopic pictures are going to be displayed in the, in the following uh, lectures. Uh, we want to show you the difference between the pictures taken with a microscope and, and, and photo camera and the endoscopic image. The, the 3D vision is uh, more difficult to, to get with the endoscope. Therefore, we recommend that you uh, focus at the central point of the pictures. For example, this is a, a view of the, uh, of, the, of the entire cellular and paracellular regions dissected with, uh, chiasma, with a chiasma, both optic nerves, both paracellular carotids, the ophthalmic artery, pituitary gland, stalk, the superior vascularization of the uh, pituitary gland and the chiasma, the superior hypophyseal arteries. Here in the uh, uh, left side, we can also see the contents of the cavernous sinus, third nerve, sixth nerve, even you can see the retroclival space dissected. Look at how just the light allows us to see the superior hypophyseal arteries in detail that could, <coughs> that could not be fully appreciated before. In this case, we are getting the retrocellular space passing above the gland without removing it. You, have, you must focus on the center uh, of the image, and here you must focus on the mammillary bodies. In this case, we have reached the retrocellular space passing below the gland. We can see the exit of both third cranial nerves from the interpeduncular cistern. In this view, we have a view, we have a, we have a, um, <coughs> a view of the mechal scape lateral to the paraclival carotid. Also, we have a view of a very important nerve used as a guidance in a skull-based surgery. This a nerve coming from the foramen lacerum up to the pterygopalatine fossa. This is the median nerve. Okay. And to finish with the dissection. Here we have an, an unusual picture in, in surgery, which is the pontomedullary medullary junction and the cerebellopontine angle seen from an anterior view. Here in the medial position, we can see the exit of the sex nerve. Here between pyramidon and, and olive, you can identify the hypoglossal nerve. Laterally, in a superior view, uh, we have uh, the facial and vestibulocochlear nerve. Inferiorly, 
we can see the lower cranial nerves related to the pica here. Finally, I want to I wanna thank the unit of endoscopic scalvates in Pittsburgh because after my, my stay there, I started my interest in anatomy. And this guy, this guy in, the, in the center is my, my friend Eugenio Cárdenas. Uh, you will enjoy tomorrow his lectures. And he has lived together all this experience, experience and, and more, I cannot tell you. Of course, uh, thank to all my colleagues of the department, with Dr. Pedro Moreno as the chairman, and especially to Dr. Gonzalez and Dr. Fernandez, who have made the 3D neuroanatomies dream real. Thank you. <laughs>